Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your SETI Institute colloquium series. Uh, my name is Frank Marchis. I will be the host for today's colloquium. So it's a great honor to uh, welcome uh, our uh, speaker today, uh, Kathleen Campbell. So Kathleen comes all the way from uh, New, uh, New Zealand. So I have a very long um, description of, you, of your work and your achievement in life. So it's going to be long, shorter than you talk, hopefully. <laughs> So, Kathleen received education in the western part in the western part of the USA. Um, she got a bachelor at the University of California in Santa Cruz, uh, then a master at the University of Washington in Seattle, and followed by a PhD at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. In the mid 1997, uh, mid the University of Oakland took her away from us. Uh, she was doing the time a postdoc at NASA's research center in the exobiology branch, and uh, she took this new endeavor to go to uh, to the southern hemisphere on this island and um, work on and teach paleo paleoecological and paleo environmental um, uh, research in the geology department of the Universi University of New Zealand. Uh, since then, she has co-supervised 60 postgraduate students and has worked uh, with numerous colleagues from multidisciplinary research projects in New Zealand, but also overseas. She's a member of uh, numerous uh, scientific uh, groups and societies. I don't know all of them, but I mentioned the Society for the Sedimentary Geology and the Paleontological Society. She's an associate editor and ed an editorial board member of uh, various journals such as uh, Scientific Reports, Palaios, Geobiology, and Paleotologia Electronica. Uh, current research focus on marine hydrocarbon seeps and terrestrial hot spring as analog for early life settings in uh, field sites everywhere in the world, such as New Zealand, Patagonia, South Africa, and Western USA. Uh, today, she's going to give a talk entitled Extreme Environments, Hydrothermal Settings for Early Life on Earth and Mars. Uh, she, will examine, um, she will examine silicious hot spring deposits to, to track the integrity of their, so of their fossil preservation through time. Uh, this method allows her to follow microbes as they turn to stone and to examine the history far back into the geological record. So please join me in welcoming Kathleen. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this talk. I'm actually a native child of the Bay Area. I grew up in Los Altos. Uh, some of my family is here, and it's really great to be back for homecoming. We went to New Zealand in 1997 as a little adventure for three years, and I've been there 18 years now. This is what happens in life. And it's just been so exciting to see uh, how the research we've been doing in New Zealand, Patagonia, and elsewhere is really coming to fruition, how we're able to begin to really look at uh, develop models for uh, extreme environment analogs for early life on Earth and potentially life on Mars and, and, and in fact, um, uh, methane signatures, uh, natural gas signatures even on Europa. I have someone studying with me in New Zealand right now from the Spanish Astrobiology Institute who wants to work on hydrates and hydrate models from New Zealand. So, so much has come full circle. It's just really terrific to be back here and be able to talk to you a little bit about the work that we've been doing. And I'll try to explain uh, a little bit more for those of you who don't know so much about extreme environments, why they're so useful for a lot of the work we're doing to try to contribute to a better understanding of the evolution of life on Earth and the possibility for life elsewhere. All right, so uh, this, I know there's a broad range of backgrounds here, and I'm trying to balance the talk between a bit of science and a bit of overview. Um, so we'll just briefly review some big questions about life in the universe, uh, a little bit about the character and preservation of early life. We need to have a signature of early life so we can, we can find it. And what are the links with Mars of the type of work we're doing? And then well, I'll get into some details about uh, and focusing on the hot springs aspect um, these, these things mineralize, they have minerals coming out of them, which means you might get to preserve uh, extreme life in them, and they're used for analog settings for elsewhere, early life on Earth and Mars. And then a little bit about a project that I was involved with last year in France. I had a sabbatical in France, and finally beginning to work on some of the earliest rocks in the world, so I'll, I'll, I'll finish with some of that. 
So a few big general questions, and many people here will be far more expert on this than me, and that is, let's just ask a few big questions. Of course, are we alone in the universe? Uh, with all the galaxies that are out there, the he there's a huge and a hot topic is looking for uh, stars that have Earth-like planets. Um, other big questions, how did life on Earth originate? What do we know about it? And what was early life like on Earth? So uh, on the left there, you can see, and I'm going to use the pointer here so everyone can see, the little white arrow. Um, you can see that th these are some microbial fossils, some cyanobacteria or photosynthesizing bacteria from 900 million year old rocks in Australia. And to some of you, that might seem like really old. But in fact, uh, when it comes to the evolution of life on Earth, it's not so very old. And you can see how well developed these organisms are and how, in fact, for an expert, how easy they are to uh, identify. But the further you go back in time, the more challenging it becomes to recognize what we call biosignatures in the rocks. Uh, and that's a painting from the Smithsonian Institution showing some early life uh, developing out here in this uh, shallow marine area and around hot springs. So the idea that hot springs might have something to do with the evolution of life on Earth is something that is um, well established. Uh, and I'll be talking more about the work we're doing on that. And then, of course, was or is there life on other planets? Uh, where would you look for it? What might it look like, given that we don't really know what the earliest life on Earth looked like and we only know about life evolving on one planet so far? How do you actually not walk right past it by accident, for example? Or what kind of signature should you be looking for? And uh, lots of people work on this, and it's not an area I work on, but of course, uh, detecting planets around other stars is becoming somewhat more routine. Uh, and my number, that's from last year, uh, 18, more than 1,800 so far confirmed. Most, as you, many of you might know, are rather large, so the Kepler Space Telescope and other techniques are now finding some terrestrial super-Earths and even some smaller planets. And they need to be within a habitable window within a solar system, within a sun. Uh, and those habitable zones, or the Goldilocks zones, change over time, over the evolution of a solar system. So what was continuously ha what is continuously habitable zone versus what was habitable uh, when Earth first formed 4.5 billion years ago uh, might have changed slightly. And you can see that Earth and Mars are sitting there um, well placed within that habitable zone, of course, in our solar system. So these are all very hot topics, big questions that we're asking, and of course, we have the Earth as our natural laboratory to try to understand some of these um, questions. And then what, is habit what do habitable planets look like? Um, measuring planetary atmospheres, noticing the difference in those atmospheres, looking for biosignatures that might be recorded in those atmospheres. There are people here and elsewhere working on those questions. And of course, the, the question of liquid water or, or water having been present, at least on Earth, is one of, one of the essential ingredients um, for life as we know it. So how did life then take hold on Earth more than three billion years ago? Geologists use a shorthand for billions of years ago. We use something called giga annum, or GA. So I, a lot of my slides will have this little GA, and that means um, uh, 10 to the 9 years ago, or billions of years ago. So more than three billion years ago, uh, people know that we've got, we know that the role of early bombardment on Earth um, is it positive or negative for, the, for, for life to take hold? Did life take hold many times or only just once? So um, we had a lot more meteorite impacts on Earth in the past, comet impacts, etc., up until 3.8 billion years ago. And one of the really interesting things that's coming out of the literature right now, uh, particularly in South Africa, is there's more and more evidence for signatures of uh, early impacts being more than we thought, more common than we thought, even back to 3.3 billion years ago when life was already well established. So there, in those interbedded rocks in South Africa where I just have just started working, you have signatures of life. I'll show you pictures of those a little later. We also have um, much evidence for impacts being relatively common all the way up to that point. And that's important because we need to know how much influence did that have. If Earth was hotter, what kind of setting did life evolve in? Was it dealing with impacts? The answer is probably yes, and in fact, certainly yes. But of course, eventually, it cooled enough that oceans formed, and we had enough um, vapors in the atmosphere to start to form at least our early atmosphere and early oceans and early continents. There are many, many uh, uh, models for how life took hold on Earth. Um, these are just three that have been popular over the years, um, the one on the far left being the terrestrial organic soup model. So 
putting together um, in the lab, in this case, different gases, sparking it up, creating amino acids, and there's many takes on this, many variations on this. Um, the terrestrial hydrothermal vent model, so in the black smokers of the oceans, maybe out on the flanks where things are a little bit cooler. They're perfect locations where you have chemistry being very dynamic and uh, places where life may have taken hold. And then, of course, the extraterrestrial seeding hypothesis, which uh, the ex interplanetary exchange, which, of course, begs the question of where did it come from in the first place, but it would have come from at least somewhere. So these are just three popular models. Now, I just want to say a few words, uh, if I may, about the hydrothermal model, the, the model that on Earth life may have evolved in under or flourished even in a hydrothermal setting. And so a few pieces of that, um, where that hypothesis has sprung from, is certainly when you look at the tree of life. And this is the tree of life from the point of view of a microbiologist. So if you want to find us in multicellular life, we're way up here. There's three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, which are single-celled organisms, eukaryotes, and way up here, plants and animals, that's us. However, down here in this tree, you'll see that all the purple branches are hyperthermophilic or very much heat-loving organisms. So the deepest roots or the most primitive living organisms are in hot springs today. So uh, an example here is in a little stream at Yellowstone where you see these pink stringy things, these biofilms adapted to living at life at 80 and 90 degrees centigrade. So heat-loving microbes, are they a remnant of the bombardment, early bombardment phase? And then the question mark is a lot of people will draw this deepest root, the last universal common ancestor. Um, they'll draw that also as hyperthermophilic, but in fact there's quite a bit of debate about whether life evolved in hot temperatures or maybe cooler pockets of life. But this is one of the reasons people are interested in hydrothermal environments is that we've got the signature of living things that tell us that the most primitive living things were heat loving. Now we know so far we obviously haven't heard anything about um, intelligent life from space as yet unless you guys are hiding something here. But we haven't got an ET visit yet. Uh, and so I want to kind of shift the focus for the moment into the microbial realm or you know, single-celled organisms that have all kinds of different metabolisms that are quite strange and, and unusual, especially from our point of view. And on Earth, those of us who work in extreme environments know that it's everywhere. Life is not just sitting here in this room. It's cold, it's hot, it's acid, it's alkaline, it's salty, it's in the deep subsurface, living off of just practically nothing. And uh, so this is great for the human imagination to be considering the possibility of life elsewhere if we study extreme environments. This is just one example in a very salty pond, these strange purple sulfur bacteria. They eat carbon dioxide. They eat hydrogen. They give off the gas bubbles of methane. For us, it's strange. For them, of course, it's totally normal. And when you look at the temperature extremes of life, you find that You've got up to 121, 122 degrees centigrade as the hottest life so far in the marine hydrothermal vents. And then we've got, of course, life adapted to quite cold conditions. We need these extreme environments on Earth to be able to imagine what life might be like somewhere else. It doesn't have to be exactly like uh, what we've got here on Earth. So there are a lot of these Earth analog extreme environments. And they're extreme because, of course, on early Earth, the world was a very different place. There certainly was no oxygen yet. There certainly was a much warmer world. There were different. Um, uh, there were there was a whole different way of the chemistry of the oceans. We need to be able to look at places where you might get a, a, a window or a, a view on these extreme environments from elsewhere. Because of course, out here we've got oxygen. We've got a, a very different world than the world was way back four billion years ago. So that's just a list of a few of these places. And the pictures are of black smokers under the deep sea. Um, the uh, endoliths, the, the organisms that live in rocks in Antarctica under very dry, very cold conditions. And then, of course, hot springs. This is one of the biggest hot springs in the world in Yellowstone. This is a walkway with some people. And so uh, the, all those colors that you see are, in fact, um, extreme uh, life, hyperthermophilic life or heat-loving organisms living in the discharge around those hot springs. So it's all there for us to, to consider and to stretch our imaginations. Now, where have people been looking for life in our own solar system? Well, of course, most of you will know Mars is one of the great targets. There's a huge amount of work and research around Mars. Um, we don't see any signs of life today, of course. Uh, but in the past, 
with the volcanism and the running water on Mars make it a, a terribly enticing candidate for a possibility of life either, either in the subsurface today or hiding somewhere today or certainly potentially in the past. We've got the largest volcano, the largest canyon carved by water. You start putting volcanoes and water together, you get hot springs and well on Earth, hot springs are absolutely chocker full of life. They sure are today. So with Mars's uh, early history being somewhat similar to aspects of Earth's early history, then again, it's another great place to be thinking about, well, if life evolved on Earth, it's certainly feasible that it would have, could have evolved on Mars. All right, so that's some of the background. So where else would you look for life? Most of you will, or many of you will know about fossil life in Martian meteorites. This is one particular famous meteorite found in uh, 1984 through the annual meteorite hunts in Antarctica. Uh, and I won't go into the details of this, but found in 84, shown to be old and Martian in 1993. And then in 1996, when I was at NASA Ames, right in the middle of my postdoc, uh, claimed uh, to contain signs of past life. You cannot imagine what kind of an impact that had at NASA when I was there, and I never saw my postdoc supervisor again, except very briefly. He was very, very busy um, dealing with the, the aftermath of this, and there's still much ongoing research in meteorites to try to determine whether or not there are really true signatures of past life within them, uh, different kinds of biosignatures. This is a morphological one, a shape uh, past signature potentially, but there are of course many chemical and other signatures that people look at. Now another <clears throat> way to look for life on Mars is to go to Mars. And luckily enough, people are able to do this. This is my favorite uh, technical paper uh, that anyone's ever written about Mars because uh, it was the discovery of opaline silica deposits on Mars by the Spirit rover, published in 2011. There was some earlier work published in Science before that. And uh, this is, a, for me, a beautiful piece of work because, of course, uh, the, the rover itself uh, was functioning a little strangely and was dragging its wheel, so dragged right over a white deposit. Everybody said, whoa, what is that? And, of course, it turned out to be almost pure silica. So everybody went to their databases on Earth and said, gosh, one of the places we see a lot of pure silica in is in fact in hot springs on Earth. And so here's Spirit, and I'm so impressed by these images, but there's Spirit there, and this is the home plate deposit, the silica deposit uh, on Mars. So I've been very excited about it. In fact, I met Steve Ruff for the first time online recently um, through Saganet, and uh, we had a nice conversation about what I thought about those deposits because I'd never actually met him and talked to him about it before. So this is a little uh, perspective of mine on this. Uh, this is from Steve Ruff's and others' work on these Martian deposits. This is what they look like. They're nod nodular and knobby. This was found by the rover. They concluded that, yes, these could potentially be um, thermal spring deposits. Great target for searching for life on Mars. Over, and this is some of their spectral data showing comparisons with um, both silicious center hot spring deposits and a deposit uh, that's in green and a deposit uh, known as silica residue, which is um, something that I can explain more to you later if you wish, um, but it's also another kind of silicious deposit found in geothermal systems. And this is just a little picture of some work of one of my students working at a hot water stream in New Zealand looking at acid sulfate chloride springs. And I said to Steve, I think it's a great hypothesis, but the pH might have been different. And here's some ideas we have from New, Zea New Zealand regarding uh, maybe better analog comparisons that you can make. And I'm excited about that because I'd like people to be utilizing New Zealand data sets and working with us on these things. Now, I'm sure every time there's uh, an image made of a, a Mars exploration program that they get modified and the um, flight dates might change. But um, here's a, just an overview of how much is going on in Mars. The Curiosity mission on the left looking at habitability, uh, the Mars 2020 rover plans, um, uh, the ESA ExoMars rover, all of these things. Oh, sorry guys, hold on here. Um, and, and many other things. So there's sample return, sam sample caching, uh, and, and many programs that more you are more familiar with than even myself. But it's a very active program and we want to be able to be providing analog information for these programs. So life detection and sample return, of course, are, are among the, the major things on the agenda. Now, given this overview, what I'd like to do is step back and go to back to Earth and see where our knowledge base is regarding the fundamental questions about the origin of life and the nature of early life. And many of these questions remain unanswered. Although much progress is being made in experimental laboratory work and 
field work and other areas, theoretical, um, but we still can't jumpstart life in the lab. If we could, you'd hear about it. Um, more about how do isolated cells form, there are models for this, how did reproduction start, and in my area and specifically, where can we find really definitive fossils that are much older than what we know so far, which is about 3.5 billion years old that's kind of confirmed. Um, and there's a hint that maybe back to 3.7 is going to be confirmed. But in fact, we'd like to go all the way back to the origin of continents and see if we can find signatures for life. And a lot of this is still unknown. So just a brief geological uh, foray into this important time frame. I'm just going to go back to this interval where we go back uh, into the Precambrian times, back to the Archean, which is any time from 2.5 billion years ago until today. Uh, sorry, uh, 3.5 to 2.5 billion years ago, um, the Archean Eon. When did life take hold in this time frame, early or late? It's really important. Was it easy for life to evolve, or was it difficult? And then when you get into this younger part of the Precambrian, the Proterozoic Eon, there's huge amounts of microbial life. It's everywhere. It's super complicated. And then once you cross this threshold of this 545 million years ago, that's the beginning of the base of, the, of animals and plants and biomineralization. And so we get a terrific fossil record of life from the Cambrian forwards. And so this transition is incredibly important. And do we have enough rocks on Earth that are well-preserved enough on Earth to even recognize um, how far back can we take this? But big things happened over this time frame. And um, the geological record is a little bit en enigmatic when it comes to the further you go back, the more beat up the rocks are, and the more difficult it is to get those biosignatures. And a great example of that is this 3.5 billion year old rocks in um, the Pilbara in Western Australia. And there, um, just in 1993, there was a paper published about lots of species of bacteria in this thing called the apex chert. And, um, by, and there were drawings of these things. And there were you know, showing, oh, look, these divisions of the cells, et cetera. And by 1992, with a second look, they were um, being claimed to be pseudofossils. So the textbook example of a microfossil, an actual thing that you could put your finger on and say, that's a biosignature, was uh, debated to the point where people aren't sure what it is that these things are anymore. And we can talk more about that if any of you want to know more about that. So identifying the oldest microfossils is not easy. There are some bona fide accepted Archean time microfossils and biofilms, which are a little less um, clear. They're more like mucus stuff that microbes give off. Uh, and there are a couple of examples. Here's one in Australia on the left. Uh, hydrothermal vent, 3.25 billion year old. And then these biofilms that attracted my attention a long time ago in, in, green, in um, South, South Africa. And in fact, I visited them just last year through my French fellowship and worked on these things. And I'll talk a little bit more about them. They're slightly, um, slightly younger. So what this is showing is that some of these early life habitats were hydrothermal because the biofilms in, um, in, green, in the Greenstone Belt in South Africa have strong bio, uh, hydrothermal signatures, as I will show you in a few minutes. So this now brings me to where I can actually place my research into some sort of context for you, because now that you've got kind of the, the where did life come from, or what do we know about it, we can now start looking at analog systems in New Zealand and other places I've worked in Argentina that are slightly older. I'm looking at hot springs. What do we know? Let's look at some biosignatures, and let's age them. Let's actually turn them into stone and see what happens to them. What do we know about that? Because by the time you get back into the Archean, there's no, there often are no molecular biosignatures left for you to measure in geochemistry terms. So um, a brief overview of why study hot springs. This is me in Argentina working on the La Marciana Center. And for those of you who do not speak Spanish, La Marciana means female Martian, which is really <laughs> ironic because that was the first ancient hot spring I worked on, and it's the female Martian. Random. Anyway, extreme environments are um, one reason to study hot springs. I've already talked to you about why they're important in terms of analogs for early life on Mars. They're also really important, though, for looking at um, geothermal exp uh, heat exploration, which you know in New Zealand we have 30 percent of our power will be generated by geothermal by 2050, which is a huge amount. Uh, we're very lucky. And pa uh, paleoclimatic studies, you know, how much water was coming out at different times during um, different times of Earth history. And then we also, this is a little model of a hot spring system. Hot spring systems 
are places where people look for gold. Because underneath the surface where the springs are, at the very um, top part of the system here in pink, where these hot spring deposits are, down in the plumbing, down toward the magma chamber in this, these volcanic systems, gold will precipitate out. It'll come out of solution as the hot water's coming up. And so uh, a lot of our work nowadays is to try to fingerprint what's down below. Is there any gold and silver down there if you just look at the surface deposits? So these are some of the things that I do and some of the reasons we study hot springs. Now, we're really lucky, and I guess it's one of the reasons we stayed in New Zealand, is that there's really a lot to do. There are many extreme environments that mineralize. They actually lock in the signature of the environment. Um, so there are offshore ones that are hydrocarbon seeps and gas hydrates, and uh, I mentioned useful for studying the icy moons, but also useful for um, hydrocarbon exploration. And then we have a lot of onshore hot springs, terrestrial hot springs, and we have a geological record of these things. So I'm going to be talking about making movies of how you get biomineralization happening through time. And when I say movies, I mean you go to a deposit of one age, and then you go to an older one, and an older one, and an older one, and they're like a stepping stone into what geologists call deep time. And we want to go back in deep time because we want to see what life was like. And life is going to be preserved in rock if we're going to find it on Earth. So we better have an idea of how it gets into the rock and does the signature stay there. And if it doesn't, how does it change? So that's really the, the gist and the core of the work that I do. So we go to these hot springs like the one shown here. My mother, who's in the audience, thank, uh, very nice to see her, came here a few years ago and came with us to see these hot springs at Iraqi Caraco, one of the best places to see beautiful hot springs depositing on active faults. So these little steps that you see in this picture are active fault scarps. And so we look at them mineralogically. We look at them in terms of the actual biosignatures that are in them that we can recognize, and then the regional geological controls that affect their preservation over time. And we can do it, so you're looking basically at the regional scale all the way down to the microbe scale of trying to understand biosignatures. So we make, it's like making movies, but they're different ages, we date the rock, and then we take the product of the hot spring, so that's a silicious deposit known as a sinter deposit, and we literally go from when they first form all the way back to the oldest ones we can get our hands on to study their processes of how they formed. So this is just an example of mineralogy, a little bit of science techniques. We use x-ray diffraction. Um, you can do really detailed x-ray diffraction on individual layers, or you can do bulk signatures. But fresh hot spring deposits that are in these um, volcanic systems are made out of amorphous opaline silica. And they have a certain signature there in the A. And then as they age, they mature mineralogically, they transition through different silica mineral phases. So it's all silica, but the actual mineral structure changes. And it loses its water. It's really hydrous, and it loses its water and loses its water until you get to microcrystalline quartz. So we have techniques for actually measuring that transformation. And in fact, when you look at these things on a scanning electron microscope, they change quite dramatically. So on the opal A or, or opaline silica, here's some microbial filaments being solidified by these little balls. And then as they lose their water, they transform into a partly crystalline uh, mineral, opal CT. And it, it has a different look. And then when you get to quartz, most of you know what quartz crystals look like. How does that affect the preservation of the biosignatures? We've done a lot of work on that. Um, the other thing we've worked on are the actual biosignatures themselves. What kind of biosignatures can you extract from these hot spring deposits? And I work a lot on these things we call textures. So a center deposit for me is like eating birthday cake. Uh, they're all so beautiful, you want to just almost eat them, which my students find very weird until they get into it and we take them in the field. These are beautiful, texturally beautiful uh, materials. And if you know how to read the rock record, you can actually interpret these textures. So um, this is just, I don't want you to get into the huge details of this, but this makes then environmental models that we can use. So way up here on this picture, We've got the vent area of a hot spring, and that's from a modern uh, terrestrial vent in New Zealand, and that's from a Patagonian one. That's the vent area. And as you go through this little diagram down to this corner, you get into cooler and cooler parts of where the hot springs discharge. And so organisms change their composition, and they get silicified, and therefore the textures change. And so you can read the rock and figure out where you are on the environmental gradient. And that tells you all kinds of information about climate and how much water was coming out, what kind of organisms were living there, because the cooler it gets, the more eukaryotes you get, the more insects and plants you get. 
And as it gets hotter, those drop out and you get to prokaryotes, which are the single-celled organisms adapted to life at high temperatures. And then which one of those preserves better? Because some preserve better than others. We've done a lot of work on that. Um, this little beautiful picture here uh, on the left, the yellowy stuff, those are bubble mats. That's their nickname. And that's cyanobacteria or photosynthesizing bacteria giving off oxygen and the oxygen bubbles getting trapped. And you're finding, we're finding this, these signatures back into the record back billions of years. So that's a signature for photosynthesis right there. The thing is that the environmental information can disappear when you crystallize these rocks. And when they go through all this, they turn out to have patches of good preservation. So this is a microbial fabric shown up close on a sinter deposit in New Zealand called umukuri, which means dog's oven, I think. Um, and uh, it's 4,000 years old. And already, patches of it are converting to quartz and being recrystallized and obliterated. And unless you were me, you might look at that rock and say, that can't be microbial, especially if it goes further down the, the track of turning to stone. So we still don't understand why some very young deposits, well, we do understand some of it, but we don't know fully why some very young deposits um, get obliterated and then much older ones are in perfect state. And this is something we're really critically looking at now. For example, the world famous Rhiney Church of Scotland, a 400 million year old Devonian hot spring system that is bearing gold. Uh, you go there and you say, oh, I see a bunch of sheep in a paddock. Where is the outcrop? The outcrop is under the paddocks. It's in the subcrop. And I was there in 2003. We had a television crew from Japan come. They got a digger out there and tore it up and then measured all the cherts, which are just uh, very old, beaten up um, hot spring deposits. And then they pulled out all these bits and pieces and have been studying them for a long time. So the cows trip over these pieces of rock. They've been studied for a very, very long period. And they're very famous because the preservation there is exceptional. It's exceptional to the point where we now better understand the early evolution of animals and plants in the Devonian because of the Rhiney cherts. They're really famous for that. So these pictures shown here are of spiders and their reproductive organs perfectly preserved in silica, male and female. Incredible preservation. We know so much about early land uh, colonization because of the Rhiney cherts, because they're mineralizing. They were mineralizing, and they mineralized these uh, animals very early. So, but no outcrop, so you can't map out anything about the hot spring system here to any degree. And then finally, the thing that we can do in, uh, in New Zealand, because we're working on that problem. You know, some things are young and they're obliterated. Some things are old and they're well preserved. And the controls on that tend to be uh, env local environmental controls and then regional causes, like uh, whether faulting was really active. How much geological history has that deposit undergone? And so um, what we're doing is trying to run a preservation movie by getting rocks of different ages. And we know the environmental gradients now and running the movie so that we can see about the preservation under a controlled situation. We know what happened to these rocks. So the first step, and this involves microbiologists, this is one of my PhD students in microbiology, um, is that you go in and you sample the modern mats and you characterize them. And you go, OK, we'll do some uh, molecular work on them, and we can tell these are cyanobacteria. And then you use another type of analysis known as fish, and you, you say, OK, what is actually in this mat? Who's who? and which bits are getting solidified and which bits aren't. So the first step is, what is it? And does it make the textures that we see in the geological record? So we've done that kind of work, which we've got a, a nice piece of this in, in press coming up fairly soon in astrobiology. So here's an example of one kind of texture known as palisade fabric, beautiful, densely packed vert vertical filaments uh, found in the cooler parts of the hot spring discharge apron. And we've gone with Jack Farmer and other people who some of you will know. We've gone and characterized how these things mineralize, how they end up in the rock record. So we go from very young, fresh material all the way to old stuff. We have a way of telling you know, how mineralogically mature it is. And it turns out that uh, the preservation is strongly affected by these silica mineral phase transformations. And in fact, what you need to do is look at the environment these things are being preserved in. And if you go to New Zealand, it's an active tectonic setting right now. And this is a great picture because it shows those rocks in the background with the bush on it. That's an active fault scarp. It's a very big fault scarp that bounds the Taupo volcanic zone. And right in this one location, we've got fumaroles and a steaming landslide deposit full of hot spring center. 
and the center is rotting right before your very eyes. So it's a perfect natural laboratory to look at what happens to these signatures while we can see them being altered. And it's very, very typical that as a hot spring system dies, the water table drops. And what do you get in those porous rocks? You get steam circulating as the hot spring system is dying. And that steam is acidified with hydro hydrosulfic uh, H2S, <laughs> the rotten smell, that acid. And so this stuff's being eaten alive. It's a wonder that anything gets preserved. It's incredible that anything gets preserved. And we want to know where those places are so we can go and find those rocks. Because most of the time, you get this or a big volcanic eruption that blows the center up completely, like what happened with the famous pink and white terraces in New Zealand in 1886 with the Tarawera eruption that blew out one of the most famous natural attractions in the world in the 1800s, gone. The pink and white terraces, I would have loved to have studied them. Beautiful hot spring system. We have paintings of it, but no center. It's all gone. So one of the other things I started to do then was to work in the Jurassic of Argentina for a bunch of reasons. And what's beautiful about Argentina is that it's a desert. Patagonia in Argentina is a desert. And you can walk along, and this is a great view, and you can see where the volcanic heat source is. There it is, a rhyolite dome right there. That's an explosive volcano uh, type. And in the late stages of the volcanism, when things aren't so explosive, that's when the hot springs tend to be preserved. So from a regional geological history point of view, we can actually see that there are certain times when hot springs will be preserved and other times when they'll be blown up. And you need to know when those are and where to go look for them. And here, because it's a lake, it was an ancient lake, you can have these uh, spring vent mounds that were underwater. And then up here where I'm standing, there's a terrace. And these were actually um, hot springs that were forming on land. And you can map them out. Unlike the Rhiney Chert, you can walk the landscape. And it's like Jurassic uh, Yellowstone National Park over a vast area, 450 kilometers by 250 kilometers. And there's about 24 of these hot spring deposits. There's gold mines everywhere. And why is it all there? Because the South Atlantic Ocean opened up in the Jurassic. And we actually broke apart South America from Australia, opened up the South Atlantic, and the crust got thin, just like in New Zealand today. When the crust got thin, we had volcanism. It's a spectacular place to study this sort of stepping stone preservation. So it's like Rhiney Chert style, but with outcrops instead of sheep paddocks. So it's been an incredible journey. And the preservation can be unbelievable. So this is for those of you who like plants and animals. Um, these are insect eyeballs, perfectly preserved. You see the compound eyes. Um, we've got root hairs of plants, not just the plants, but their root hairs. This is a little arthropod limb with little bristles on the limb. So the little hairy bristles. And then these are um, silicified gas bubbles, one here and one here, with microbial filaments in them really spectacular because we can go to places where it's really bad preservations and places where it's fantastic and interrogate these systems and know what we're looking at because we, you can map it. And that's one other thing I want to do. You're going to look at this picture and say, oh, a bunch of colors, pretty busy. What is this? This is a geological map. It's one of our geological maps of a hot spring system at Cerro Negro, which is right now being developed into a huge gold mine. When I first went there, the gold mine wasn't there yet. You look at a geological map and you go, I don't know what all those little pictures, what all, what all those colors mean. But it, it's a story for you to read if you know how to read a geological map. And it's worth us spending a moment looking at this particular one because it's so essential to understand the regional controls on preservation of hot springs if you do it properly. From this regional scale, which is what we can do in Mars, for example, to the micron scale, the, the super detailed scale of the preservation. So I'm just going to explain the beauty of geological maps to those of you who don't know anything about them. So there's the North Arrow. And this here um, is these dotted outlines are volcanic centers in the Jurassic. So what that represents was there were two volcanoes there. You can't see, in this case, the volcano anymore, but you can see where they were centered. And all of the pink and bluish gray and green are different kinds of volcanic deposits. So that's really the core of the volcanoes. Now, what's really important here is that this is now going to be a gold mine because of the pink, bright, magenta vein system. You see the vein system there. The Aurica vein, in English, Eureka. The Aurica vein over here in the southwest. Let's see if I can get my pointer. There it is. That is the biggest vein anybody I've ever seen. Uh, it's a gold vein. It's quartz, but it's got gold in it. And then up here in the other portions. 
So the system itself, this part of the system, is eroding back the deeper part of the volcanic system. That's where the plumbing is, where the gold is. And the whole thing's tilted upward, so this part of the volcanic system is higher up in the, in the hot hydrothermal system. And guess where you find the hot springs? In the higher part. Because luckily, the geology has eroded back. It's tilted up and eroded back. And in here, we see all of these beautiful travertines. Travertines are hot spring deposits made out of limestone or carbonate. And some of them are still pristine um, travertine. And some of them have been silicified. And what's truly spectacular is that in places, the veins run right from depth, and they run right up to the surface. And there's the hot spring saving on top. And we can see the whole thing because it's in a desert and it's exposed. It's spectacular for us to try to understand the relationships between what was going on in the whole hydrothermal system and the preservation of fossils. So if we look at our beautiful geological map then, in the southwestern area where the Aurica vein comes up and hits the surface, we had early silicification of the travertine, beautiful preservation of the microbial fabric, in fact, the best preservation. Here's the Aurica vein with a person for scale. It's gigantic, this vein. And it's got the biggest feeder, or uh, gold feeder, and more fluids, more geofluids for longer period. It explains why the preservation is so good. It's because it was the perfect geological conditions for the perfect preservation, like a perfect storm. And this is what we're looking for in the record, because most of the time, it's not perfect. And we want to know how far, you know how far away from perfect conditions can we go and still recognize a fossil signature of life in an extreme environment. So that's what I think is so powerful about this type of work. Um, so lastly, then, I just want to cover one more topic, and then, and then I'll be finished. And that is that I wanted to mention the work at CNRS, uh, the National Center for Re uh, Scientific Research. It's a huge government organization in France. I was working in Orléans. I worked with Francis Westall, who works there on early life, uh, prebiotic chemistry and is affiliated with the ESA, the European Space Agency program for Mars. And we have a long history, um, but we had never really met formally until recently, but we've interacted a lot over the years. And the idea was to try to look at hydrothermal systems on Earth billions of years ago as crucibles for early life and actually compare directly uh, work that she's doing in South Africa in those systems in the Barberton Greenstone Belt and this is Francis Restall, and we were there last year. This is pictures along the, um, in the Barberton Greenstone Belt in South Africa, comparing to our Argentinian and New Zealand examples. And these are microbial biofilms uh, that we are looking at and comparing directly, using the same techniques, understanding the systems. Uh, and so I had a fellowship to do this work and had an incredible experience there. So in South Africa, if you go and you measure a section, which we did, and you interpret the paleoenvironmental setting, which we did. And I'll skip over the geology to say, basically, there were tides there. There were some wave currents. There was some volcanism with ashfall. And um, you get these beautiful deposits that are so much like today that it's scary. From someone like me, who've never seen anything that old. And the other thing is that the system is full of hydrothermal uh, injections of the white material. So these hydrothermal injections are really important because the system was at the same time that it was forming, there were hydrothermal fluid injections of silica. And the best preservation of the microbes there turn out to be associated with the hydrothermal areas. Uh, and that's, we did a lot of work on that that's just been published in geology. So the setting for this is that you have a lot of volcanic ash fall. Early Earth had a lot of silica in the oceans because there were no, um, none of the microplankton that we have today that pull silica out, none of them existed yet. And it was hot. And so there was just a huge amount of silica circulating uh, through the hydrothermal systems down below and up above. And you get a very clear signature of strong hydrothermal influence. You can do in situ mapping of your deposits and pull out spectra of all kinds of hydrothermal trace elements. So there's no doubt there is a hydrothermal signature. This is some of the early life. Uh, these are 3.3 billion year old microbial fossils. Um, again, found mainly around the signatures that we have for hydrothermalism. So we have these little laminated, laminated are thin layers that are little wavy layers uh, of mats that are forming on the seafloor surface three billion years ago, more than three billion years ago. And they have been interpreted as phototrophic maps, mats made by some kind of microorganisms that were uh, actually based in phototrophy. But we also found other clotted things. And I don't mean clot like, a, like a, a clot, like you're not a smart person, but clots of organic material 
that are also found, these clots here, and in fact found uh, spatially beneath those mats that were known, that are interpreted as heterotrophs, so organisms living in the sediment, eating maybe other organic matter, maybe even decaying these mats. And because of the lovely work you can do in France, we were able to target and fingerprint this material. And so all that green that you see, this is laser Raman spectroscopy, all that green you see is, is carbon, is carbon. And it's been measured in carbon isotopic signatures. It's got a carbon isotopic signatures that are indicative of, of, um, of something living. There are some other funny minerals around. The orange is quartz, which is silica, but also anatase, which is a titanium oxide mineral, which I'm quite interested in. And I'm hoping people here can tell us more about anatase, because it keeps being found with these organisms. It's also found in volcanic settings. So we're interested in that as a biomineral, potentially. Um, so we did this very detailed work from the environmental point of view, right down to the scale of the microbe. And we were able to compare the Archean biofilms, like this, these laminated mats and these clots, directly with the Jurassic work. This is from San Agustin in Patagonia. Very similar textures and fabrics. Here's a bubble a photo. That's a, a gas bubble. These will be interpreted as phototrophic mats and all this clotted stuff. And so we were able to put these things under the same microscopes, under the same instruments, and in similar settings. These are silicified, hot uh, environments, and start to really compare them directly. And it's surprising how well preserved we could find when we knew what we were looking for, and also how, well, how advanced life really was already by 3.3 billion years ago. Totally advanced. I mean, we had different types of metabolism and different signatures, um, others that more than what I'm showing you here. So we don't even scratch the surface yet on the origin of life, and we're practically at the oldest rocks that you can find this life in. And we still don't know, because we don't have the rocks to go further back. And that's why we were talking this morning that Mars might be the place to find that preserved. Because on Earth, things have been so beaten up, we don't have the rocks anymore. And even when you go back to these rocks, I cannot tell you how surprised I was that they look so much like younger rock. And, and so where do we go to the stuff that was earlier than this? Where do we go? And then just a week ago, I was in the Pilbara in Western Australia, luckily enough connected up with the people from Australia who are working on slightly older, 3.5 billion year old rocks. And we're just, uh, they've been working on these for a while. And I walked up to this, this is a bedding plane view and very old rocks, put my hand on it and said, well, that's a microbial biofilm. There's no doubt about it. All the Archean people fight about this all the time. But as a geologist working in a younger environment, I just walk in and say, well, that definitely is microbial. So now you guys need to find the signatures to show it. Because clearly, this looks just like Jurassic of Patagonia. This just looks just like New Zealand. And there they are, hydrothermal veins all over the place in the Pilbara leading right up to these deposits, exactly the same as in Africa, with a few differences that make it interesting. Um, so on that note, I just want to summarize then that I'm, I'm a firm believer that early life was at least in part hydrothermally influenced. There may be other places where it wasn't, but everything I've seen shows a strong association. And I think that hot springs are great analogs for habitable settings on Mars and early Earth. So on that note, I'll finish here. And if you guys have any questions, um, I'd be happy to take them. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is open for questions. I have one here. Excellent talk. Uh, very inspiring. We are glad that an American is doing a lot of great work in New Zealand. Congratulations. And local. Um, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the nanostructures and nanomaterials. Mm -hmm. Do you see any uh, nanostructures, nanomaterials uh, formed in those days, yeah. which may give clue for us for creating a manufacturing environment? I believe nano is science still, not technology, not manufacturing, not with any supply chain at all anything that we can learn. Thank you. OK, thanks. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm familiar through Frances Westall's work at Kitty's Gap, which is in Australia. Um, she, when you get to the nano sims level, which is an instrument that obviously is nan it's a nanotechnological uh, measuring device, um, what you find with the nano sims are uh, even smaller materials than what I'm showing here. The thing is that they become morphologically very simple. And so to interrogate them at that level, 
that's where the controversy really builds because then people will say, well, those uh, spheroids are actually, they're, they're not life. And so we, she sees them, we see them, and they're within this organic material, and you can actually target studying them often with the synchrotron radiation. And that's work that's in progress. So I think the answer is that, yes, eventually we can even see nano-sized materials preserved, not just these what are considered to be much larger. So I see potential for that. The, the, the issue is as soon as you start working with these really old materials or even Martian meteorites, there are other explanations for many of these things. And so you just have to, you have to eliminate everything before you can go in and say, there has to be a nanosignature there as well. Of course there has to be. And she's beginning to see them morphologically as well as with targeted uh, you know, isotopic work. But uh, those of you who work in isotopes know that isotopes tell you, can tell you many, many different things. They're not, they're not, it's not a self-totally constrained system working with isotopes. It's multiple approaches that will work. But there should be potential for a better understanding of nanomaterials, cer certainly. Is the reason for um, better preservation of the fossils on Mars due to the sluggish plate tectonics and the difference mm. in the um, chemical composition of the atmosphere? Uh, potentially, yes. Certainly, the biggest issue is this plate tectonics. And it's not just plate tectonics because plates crash into each other. But remember, continents on Earth were forming at this time. So there were literally intrusions coming up from below and eating, at, eating whatever the material was that was beneath. And so they'll find um, zircon minerals, which are quite durable on Earth, and they can date those zircon minerals. And they know that there were continental remnants earlier than these ones that I've been showing you. But often, you're left with a zircon mineral, not a, not a biosignature. So, so definitely, if you stop plate tectonics or you don't have a lot of plate tectonics, certainly that has to be the case. I'm less familiar with other potential reasons why, but one of the big ones has got to be that you're not destroying what you created, which we do all the time on Earth, even now. We blow up, you know, the, the supervolcano in Taupo is about to blow up at any time, and that'll wipe, up, wipe out not only people, but all of the hot spring deposits I'm working on, if that were to happen, which would be pretty tragic on a bunch of levels. So, uh, no, strangely enough, the more I think about it, the more that it would be really wise to go to Mars to try to find for the bits of history that we are missing here on Earth, which we may never find. You, you talked about some work that you're doing in an area where, where there was a gold vein. Yeah. And it, it seemed like, like uh, some, some gold miners may be working in that area. Is there a, how, do you, how do you resolve the conflict between yeah. gold mining and, yeah. and preserving what you're... Gosh, yeah, that's a good question. And it's not just the gold mining, it's also the environmentalists. So in New Zealand, uh, we, there's a gold mining area in New Zealand that I'm starting to work in with students. And there's a line geographically where to the south, uh, there's gold mining and it's fine and everybody there wants the jobs. And to the north, it's, for lack of a better word, the hippies living there and they are definitely not allowing any gold mining. <laughs> So we're allowed to go study these hot spring deposits in the north, but you can't mine them even if you found tons of gold in them. Um, so there's the issue of that as well. And what's interesting, what I've learned from pa working in Patagonia is two things. Number one, the best li wildlife preservation today is on the properties of gold mines because nobody's allowed to shoot the animals. So the animals all come in, the guanaco and the flamingos, on the gold mining property, and they have terrific conservation going on there because you don't, you're not allowed to shoot a gun. On a, on a gold mine property. Um, but the other thing is that the, the miners, obviously all they really want to get at is the gold. And so the, my colleague there is a, is a consummate academic geologist. He goes in and he maps this stuff because he wants to understand the hydrothermal system, just like I do. And what's funny is that he likes to get out as soon as they start developing a gold mine because the gold mining people, they could care less. They just follow the vein. They don't know why the veins are there. They don't know where they should go next. They might drag you in to say, well, where else should we go? But there's this funny, they, they, they're obviously economically driven, of course. And so there's this interesting balance that I've observed between the academic people and the, um, the economic people. And I think we need each other. Because who told us where all the hot springs were, the fossil ones? The miners. They would, but they didn't study them. They didn't know anything about them. They didn't know what information was in them to help them understand what they were doing. So you just have to educate each other, I think. Okay. There was a question here a few seconds. 
for, for these th these ancient structures, is is there anything to be learned from say isotopic balance of uh, about atmospheric uh, conditions? Uh, are, 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 are molecules, are atoms being captured? Uh, yeah, cap okay, good question. Um, there is, this is really quite interesting because our funding ran out in New Zealand just as we got the whole regional picture and we wanted to get into the analytical, we ran out of money, but that's okay because now I'm working with other people and really making much more exciting comparisons. But um, these hot spring deposits do have fluid inclusions in them and they're quite tiny. You need a special stage to study them. Uh, but there's debate amongst us whether or not you're just recording the most recent overprint of geology. For example, uh, when, a, when a big volcanic system dies, you not only get sulfuric acid overprinting of most stuff, which changes, you know, the chemistry is changing as the hot spring's dying, but you also have this problem of uh, oftentimes in the last gasp of volcanism, for some reason everything gets silicified, like everything, you know, lake sediments, everything. So everybody comes up to us and said, look at this hot spring deposit. And we go, ooh, that's silicified lake sediment. So that late overprinting of silica is an issue for us <laughs> because what are you actually trapping in those fluid inclusions? However, we have the perfect opportunity to study that transition because we've got rocks of all different ages and we know their history. The key is to know their history at the big level in order to understand what you're looking at at this scale of the microbe. And I've seen many, many studies where people will study the microbes, especially in early Earth systems, and go, oh, I've done all this fancy isotopes on them. But they don't know anything about their samples a lot of the time. They'll get a sample sent to them from so-and-so. And what I'm really enjoying is that we've got a team that actually goes from, OK, how did this place get here? Why is it here? All the way down to, why is this thing preserved here and not over there? And that is the only way that I think we're going to make any progress. Then you can interrogate the specimens and pull out the best signature. And I've seen it done finally in the, in the Precambrian where they looked at oxygen isotopes across all these cherts and they finally figured out that they needed to look at preservation. And then they eliminated all the ones that are badly preserved and the, the temperature of the Archean seawater, th you know, three and a half billion years ago went from a, an estimate of 70 degrees centigrade down to now 55 degrees centigrade. And for the Proterozoic, which is a little bit younger, 2.5 billion, that seawater might have been 45 degrees centigrade. That's hot. You don't want to soak in that. So organisms were evolving in hot seawater, but not as hot as people thought based on random isotope studies. So the key, I think, is to go, OK, where is the best preservation? How do we know it's the best preservation? And then do your analytical work. So there's a lot of potential there, a lot more than I, I think. And the other thing is that the methane isotopes studied more from the hydrothermal vent point of view. There's been some nice work done characterizing primary inclusions versus secondary ones and then getting the signature of the methane and its bacterial, apparently. I haven't done that work myself. So huge potential there to do a lot more. In much younger rocks than you've been talking about, you know, things from the age of the dinosaurs, they found really relatively well-preserved things like collagens and things like that, real yeah. biological molecules. How old is the oldest thing we've found where you can still identify something that's clearly a biological molecule? Wow, OK. Well, that's a mine. You're asking me to step on a landmine, thank you. Um, OK, I don't work on the oldest stuff that way yet. I'm starting to. And you know, just a, a couple of years or a few years before I got involved with it, everybody thought we could measure um, lipid biomarkers or tough protein materials. Uh, from uh, living organisms to, 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 sig to get a signature of is this a eukaryote or prokaryote. And there's been a huge amount of work done recently that has shown that all of, almost all of that early work was contamination. Uh, so, you know, you can go into the Proterozoic, you can go back maybe, I think, as far back as perhaps, you know, two, 2.5 billion years. But people are kind of having to reboot for the Archean. And my feeling, and this is seriously her heretical, is that textures, those textures I showed you are the best biosignatures, and they are the most attacked for being, oh, they could be anything. Because you can create stuff in the lab that looks like that stuff. But if you don't do the context work that I'm talking about, which is real basic geology, I'm talking about, you know, geology 101 to figure out where your rock is from. Is it an igneous rock, or is it a sedimentary rock? And these have been huge issues. You would think the three main rock types, we can tell them apart. You go back into the Archean and you run some fluids through them and you beat them up and you smash them in faults and then people can't tell whether you have a volcanic rock or a sedimentary rock 
and you don't normally find fossils in volcanic rocks. So you think Geology 101 is sorted out for the Archean, and it is not. So you have to go back to basics every single time. And then you're going to be able to push that back further and find out. But right now, we've got a problem with, sure, you can get carbon out, and people are pulling it out. There's kerogen, but that's modified carbon. And so um, it is a bit of a minefield, and the only way to deal with it is super detailed nano work, but understanding where you're getting your samples from. Great talk, Kathy. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Family member. Just thought I'd, that's a caveat. That's a, like, what do you say when you're, um, you're just disclosing all information? I'm a ringer. Yeah, a ringer. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so based on your work, if you, um, can you actually, do you have a really good idea of where you would go to Mars to collect these rocks? And, and what kind of rocks would you want them to bring back to you so that you can study them? Oh, boy, okay. Right, well, can I give you my ideal rather than what's practical? Yeah, I want to find a hot spring next to a volcano. And, you know, as far as I know, they don't go up very steep terrain on those vehicles yet. But if I were walking around on Mars, I'd want to go look for, for I'd want to go to all the spring deposits. They don't, I don't care if they're in a lake. It doesn't matter to me whether they're hot or cold. But you want to go somewhere where there was a change in the chemistry between the fluids, the water, and um, something maybe, springs, where they're bringing up a funny different kind of fluid. And you've got a boundary, a chemical boundary that you're crossing, because that's where life likes to exploit those boundaries, extract out the energy, and use it, because there's more energy there for them. So, you know, in, in detail, I haven't looked at that. That's something I'm starting to get into through the work with Francis Westall. But for me, I'd want to go where there was an interface between um, fluids that were changing. And it has to be relatively, it doesn't have to be near the surface, but for me to understand it, if it's in a spring, then I'd be really happy. And there are springs on Mars, not just the one I was talking about. So that's where I would go and, uh, and then get it sent back. And we'd, we'd have to have a big debate about that. Because every time you see a morphological signature, people say, oh, that could be anything else. But I have found time and again that the morphological signatures, the actual texture leads us to the best stuff, always. So you got it. You can say, sure, it might not be that. But the best preservation always, we can't just go randomly out there and pick up a rock. We've got to have an idea of what we're looking for. And that, I'm afraid, is, turns out to be the morphology and the shape. So I'm a firm believer in using that, but just being very careful that you might have something that's inorganic, too. So why are you stopping on Mars? Why, why not paying attention to what's going on in the rest of the solar system? Sure. There is a volcanic activity on Venus, announced last week, on Enceladus, on Triton, on Ceres. We're not on a limited. Lot of bodies like We're that. not limited to Mars. At, not at all. Absolutely not. not. It happens to be where a lot of the energy is going, but. We don't have to have it all go there. OK. So before sending you to Mars, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are going to just give you this uh, cup and, oh, uh, as you. a memory. And uh, thank you for coming here and giving us this wonderful talk. Wonderful. Thank you, thank very you much. Frank. Thanks so much.